We're going to continue now with our look at the role and function of angels in the scriptures. And uh, when we began this study, I mentioned that we can distinguish between the activity of angels as it takes place within heaven, those seraph, uh, seraphim who are immediately present around the throne of God, and we've looked at that briefly. And today I want to turn our attention to the way in which angels function with respect to this world and to the created order. Uh, in the book of Job, we have a reference to the angels as they were present at the time of the creation of the universe as we know it. In chapter 38 of the book of Job, when God is interrogating Job after Job had, had in some sense of defiance, demanded answers from God about his circumstances, and we remember that this chapter begins with a serious rebuke that the Lord gives to Job when he says, Who is this who darkens counsel with words without knowledge? Now gird up yourself like a man, I will question you and you will answer me. So after Job demands answers from God, God's response is to interrogate Job. And he says to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? And to what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Now here there is an allusion in a poetic discourse to the morning stars singing together with the sons of God. And traditionally, interpreters of the book of Job see the reference to the sons of God who were present during the time of creation as a reference to angels. And that in itself has provoked a lot of, uh, of speculation and controversy with respect to that use of the phrase, sons of God. You remember in the early chapters of Genesis, after <clears throat> Cain kills his brother, Abel, we get the list of the descendants of uh, Seth and then the descendants from Cain, and we see this radical expansion of evil, and then we read that the daughters of men intermarried with the sons of God and produced this race of seriously deviant people. And many commentators have taken that text to mean an intermarriage between human women and angelic beings because they are referred to as the sons of God who married the daughters of men. I don't take that position, by the way, in that text. I believe that what was involved there was the intermarriage between the descendants of Cain and the descendants of Seth that created the final corruption of the whole race. But we do see that phrase, sons, sons of God or son of God, used in the Bible not only for Christ, not only for godly people, but also for angels. If we look again at verse 7, we say, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. It's an interesting poetic image because it involves the personification uh, of stars, that is, attributing to the stars in the sky uh, uh, personal characteristics, such as singing. And this would say at the earliest stages of creation, when God sets the stars in the sky, that the stars celebrate creation along with the sons of God who shout for joy. And so the only thing that we hear, get here is that though the Bible nowhere gives us 
a detailed description of the creation of the angels. We know that the angels were present at some time during creation, and we know that the angels themselves were created beings. And that's important, and it'll become even more important later on when we look at fallen angels and specifically at the biblical concept of Satan. Because in our day, the tendency is to attribute to Satan divine attributes, where we often forget that Satan is a creature. And even though the angels that we've been examining so far that attend the immediate presence of God and therefore are heavenly uh, beings, they are still heavenly creatures. Creatures who were there during the work of creation, the creation of this natural world, that, uh, but they celebrate that creation as they themselves are creatures. Now, we also see that the angels not only are involved at the time of creation, but we know that after creation, that God sustains everything that He makes in the order of this world, and that He rules over the created sphere. The laws of nature, for nature are His laws, and the outworking of history follows the pattern of His sovereign rule. In a word, we do not believe in a, an action of creation by which God creates something and then, like the deistic God, steps out of the picture, winds up that clock, and lets it function or run down according to its own internal uh, mechanical operations, but rather the God who creates the universe also sustains that universe. He keeps it in existence, and He rules over it. And one of the ways in which God mediates His providential supervision and rule over history and over creation is through the mission of these creatures that He created to carry out His will, namely the angels. Now, you see, for example, the first... Uh, appearance that we have of angels in the Bible is found early in the book of Genesis, apart from the appearance of Satan, who is the fallen angel, and we'll treat him separately. But now we're concentrating our attention on the good angels, the angels who are working with God in His providential care of the world and of history. We see the strange phenomenon after Adam and Eve fall and are expelled from the Garden of Eden. And they are forced to live east of Eden, and they are not permitted to seek sanctuary or residence back in the Garden of Eden. And though this is an experience that Milton would write of in his classic Paradise Lost, that there may have been strong inclinations of Adam and Eve to seek to regain that Edenic uh, enjoyment of paradise there in the garden, they were not able to come back into the garden. Why not? Because God posted a sentry at the entrance to the Garden of Eden, of Eden. and that sentry who was carrying out God's providential government at that point in history was an angel who was posted there wielding a flaming sword. Now again, this is just a brief mention of the function of a particular angel in the early chapters of Genesis, but it's pregnant with theological significance for our whole understanding of the doctrine of providence. First of all, we need to see that in that incident where God posted the angel with the flaming sword at the entrance to uh, the Garden of Eden, this is the first representation of government in Scripture. In terms of law enforcement officials, 
so that the first law enforcement officer to be involved in the work of uh, human history was not even a human being, but an angel who was there bearing the sword against potential evil doers. Now that little glimpse of angelic activity there, along with other passages that we'll look at in the ensuing time that we have today, has uh, provoked some fascinating studies about the role of angels in human government. One of the most respected biblical scholars of the 20th century was a Swiss church historian and biblical scholar by the name of Oscar Kuhlmann. And since many the most theologians spend little time studying the role and the function of angels in redemptive history, uh, Kuhlmann changed that particular mold and did extensive studies of angels and wrote essays concerning the concept of angel powers in Scripture. The idea being that above earthly government, there is a providential rule of each government in the world by angel powers, some of which are good, some of which are evil. And as the Scriptures tell us that God raises up kingdoms and tears down kingdoms, what Kuhlmann was getting at was that the way in which he raises them up or tears them down is through the mediation of authority and power by angelic beings. And you remember when Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God in the New Testament, he tells us the reason why we need to be clad with this spiritual armor is because our struggle in this world is not with flesh and blood. What? With powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's one translation. Other translations read, or spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. In the Uranus is the text. That is, in the heavenly spheres, there are evil powers that have evil influence mediated through powers and principalities, that is, earthly governments. And so what Paul is saying is, is that the people of God need to have the whole armor of God because their struggle is not just against people, but against governments that have been or can be demonized, that standing behind these worldly forces and authority are supernatural powers that for the most part remain invisible to us. But not only do we have these demonic powers involved in world governments where governments can really, really become empires of evil, but there are also those agents of God for good who are involved in nations and in governments. And an example of that we'll see by looking, if we can, at the book of Daniel in chapter 12, verse 1, we read these words, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Now, Michael is identified earlier in the book of Daniel as an archangel. We distinguish levels of authority among the angelic host in Scripture. And the difference between an archangel and an angel is simply a difference in rank and authority. 
the word arche in Greek, which is one of the first words that anybody who studies Greek, or at least Koine Greek, learns because usually you follow the opening of the Gospel of John as your textbook, and the Gospel of John begins, N-R-K, ein ho logos, that is, N-R-K means in the beginning, and the word R-K means beginning, beginning, or chief, or ruler. And so, though in John 1, it begin, refers to a place in time, the sort of the head of time, the chief of time, the beginning, usually the word is used uh, to refer to that which is in the highest place of authority. And we use it in the English language. It comes across into English with the prefix arch. We have enemies and we have arch enemies. In football, we have rivals and we have arch rivals. In the church, we have bishops and we have arch bishops. In the construction, we have builders and we have architects. And that word means chief builder. That's what an architect is. And so on, we see that word frequently used in the English language. Well, it's also functioning that way in the Greek, and we can distinguish between an angel and an archangel. Or we can distinguish between a heretic and a heresiarch. An heresiarch is an arch heretic, a really bad heretic. And so the angels who are archangels are those who are commanders of the heavenly host who are seated in the position of supreme authority, uh, again, not of those who are attending the immediate presence of God, but who are the agents of God to exercise God's rule and God's authority over creation. And one of those who is named in Scripture is Michael, who appears here in the book of Daniel to be the angelic manifestation of the power of God to redeem his nation. Also, Gabriel is so understood in biblical history as an archangel, and we will look at his uh, activity later on as he serves as the chief messenger of God in Scripture. Also, we see that the angels that we encounter in the Old Testament, particularly, often manifest themselves in human form. Let's take a, an example of that that we find in Genesis in chapter 18. There is, uh, in verse 1, this text, "...the Lord appeared to him," that is, to Abraham, "...by the terebinth trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes, and looked, behold, three men were standing by him." And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I now have found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant now. There's something a little difficult here. Angels are not to be worshipped. And yet the response of Abraham to these three who come to him by the oaks of Mamre is a response of worship. He's on his face and doing obeisance before them, which causes many commentators to believe that what you have here are two regular angels plus the angel of the Lord who is so closely connected with God that he wears, as it were, the very mantle of God and can be seen as either a theophany or as a Christophany, that is, as an outward manifestation of God Himself, or as an outward manifestation of the pre-incarnate Christ. Many people believe that Melchizedek was really Christ appearing in the Old Testament in human form under the guise of, of uh, Melchizedek, and the commander uh, of the Lord of hosts in Joshua 
is also often seen as a Christophany in the Old Testament. But in any case, we find these three who appear here in Genesis uh, to consult with uh, Abram. And Abram said, My Lord, if I found favor, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought. Wash your feet. Rest yourselves under the tree. I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourself. And so then they go on and they have this uh, conversation. And Abraham is interceding for the future of Sodom. And we are aware of that story. Then in chapter 19, verse 1, we say, Now the two angels, that's presumably are the two angels without the angel of the Lord of hosts, came to Sodom, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them. He bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Hear now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. And they said, No, we'll spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly, so they turned into him and entered his house. He made him a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now, before they lay down, we read that the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, surrounded the house. And they called the lot and said, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out that we may know them carnally that these angels were so magnificently attractive that the Sodomites sought to use them sexually. And this is the story that takes place where Lot, trying to protect the angels, offers his daughters instead. And they'll have none of that. But what's significant for our concern is this, that... They said in verse 9, stand back. And they said, this one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. We will deal worse with you than with him. So they pressed hard against Lot, came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands, pulled Lot into the house with them, and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great. So they became weary trying to find the door. So these angels who are supposed to receive biblical hospitality in the house of Lot, intercede to save Lot's white life and his family, pulling him away from the mob in the safety in the house, and then using their powers to strike these wicked sodomites blind. And so in this case, the angels are there to minister to Lot and to his family in a time of crisis. And that's a key we want to hold on to for future consideration because that also is one of the functions of the angels that God sends to work out his providential rule over history. One of my favorite angel narratives in all of Scripture is one found in the second book of Kings, and I enjoy this particular uh, narrative because it reveals directly and indirectly so many things that we need to understand about the nature and function of angels. So let's take a few moments to look at this narrative that uh, takes place during the life of the prophet Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning at verse 8. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. So the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. And thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Now you see here, what the king of Syria is trying to do is to plan an ambush against the king 
of uh, Israel. But somehow, all of the secret plans that the king of Assyria is making, or the king of Assyria is making, are told to the king of Israel so that he avoids the trap. So we read in verse 11, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He automatically assumes that he has a spy in the camp. And so he inquires of that. And one of the servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. And so he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, Surely he is in Dothan. So you get the picture. The king of Syria finds out that it's not one of his men that's betraying him, but supernaturally his plans are being communicated by the prophet Elisha to the king of Israel. And so now the king of Syria changes his plan. If I'm ever going to be effective in capturing the king of Israel, first thing I got to do is get rid of this Elisha. So he inquires as to where Elisha is staying, and he's told that Elisha is in Dothan. So he sets about to execute his plan to capture Elisha. So we read in verse 14, Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God rose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with the horses and chariots, and his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So here Elisha goes to sleep in his little place in Dothan. His servant gets up first in the morning, goes to open the blinds and the curtains to let the light in. He looks out one side of the room, sees all these chariots and soldiers of the Syrians. He goes to the other side of the house, sees nothing but chariots and he goes to the front and goes to the back, you know, reminds me of the story of Tano and the Lone Ranger being surrounded by Indians on every side. And the Lone Ranger says to Tano, what do we do now? And Tano says, what do you mean we, white man? <laughs> and so <laughs> that's kind of this, what I picture here when, when Elisha's servant sees this army surrounding this little house they're in. So he runs up. And he wakes up Elisha and he tells him of the situation, the predicament. He says, we're surrounded on every side by chariots and, and armies. What are we going to do? And listen to Elisha's response. And so he answered, do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, if we can read between the lines here, obviously Elisha's servant is completely flabbergasted by Elisha's response. You don't get it, boss, you know. I just told you there are countless soldiers and chariots around us. And look around, Elisha, there's you and there's me. What do you mean that those who are with us are more than those who are with them? And so Elisha prays, and he said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike these people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. As I said, there's so many things that we learn from this particular passage. One has to do with an ongoing controversy uh, among theologians in the history of the church. Because when Jesus mentions in the New Testament to his disciples not to forbid little children to come, uh, little children, little children, we don't talk about little children, uh, little children to come to him 
He says, for such, you know, belong to the kingdom of God. And he later on goes on to say that they behold, their an I mean, their angels are watching over them in heaven. And the idea that was extrapolated from that statement of our Lord was that every person in, in the kingdom, every Christian, has a guardian angel assigned to him or to her to take care of them. Because again, as we will see a little bit later, that the author of Hebrews tells us that the primary function of angels in terms of this world is to minister to God's people. And so as I say, there is a strong tradition in church history that every person has a particular angel assigned to them, sort of like it's a wonderful life. And every time you hear the tinkle of the bell, an angel's getting their wings and that sort of thing. But here, what we find in this story is there's not one angel watching out for Elisha, but the whole heavenly host is mobilized to defend him in his critical uh, hour of need. Now, we see the same thing in the New Testament with respect to the multitudes of angels that attend the ministry of Jesus. And we'll look at that a little bit later. But for now, let's see that here we have multitudes of angels sent to intercede in behalf of Elisha. Now, at the very beginning of this series, I told the story of the rescue of miners that were underground for several days and how they testified that they had been ministered to by angels, and that's how they explained their survival. You'll remember that story that I told you, and how the press automatically assumed that they were hallucinating. And the assumption in the secular worldview in which we live is that anybody who sees an angel, by definition, must be subject to hallucinations. And a hallucination occurs when somebody sees things that aren't really there. And I mentioned Rudolf Bultmann as saying that you can't live in our sophisticated society and still be believing in ghosts and goblins and things that go bump in the night and in invisible realities such as angels. But at the heart of Judeo-Christianity is an uncompromised supernaturalism that says that there is much more to reality than meets the eye that God himself is invisible. And yet there's nothing more central to Christianity than the reality of the existence of God. And the thing that makes, us so, as makes it so difficult for us to be faithful, I believe, to God is because he's invisible. And uh, it's hard to worship that which you do not see and obey one with whom you've never spoken, and so on. But the same thing may be true of, of angels. They're invisible most of the time. There are times throughout biblical history, as we read in the case of the visitors to Sodom and elsewhere, when the angels manifest themselves, usually in human garb, but under ordinary circumstances, they are spirit beings. They're real, they're creatures, they're spirit beings who are invisible. And if we really do believe in the message of the Christian faith, we have to understand this as part and parcel of that message, that the reality in which we live contains much more than meets the eye. Now that should not be that much of a stretch to us living on this side of the Enlightenment living on this side of the invention of the telescope, living on this side of the invention of the microscope, because the scientific revolution of the modern era took place when our perception of reality was increased and enhanced by instruments that enabled us to see things that could not be seen by the naked eye. 
You know, one of the crises in the time of Galileo was the scientists of his day, as well as the bishop of his day, refused to put their eye on the, uh, the telescope because they didn't want to believe the evidence that the telescope was revealing about how the heavens really are structured and how the orbits of the, star, of the planets and so on really take place. And they've discovered, I mean, the, the whole revolution that we call the Copernican Revolution was a revolution in science that was provoked by a sudden ability to see what previously was unseen. And if that revolution take place with the telescope, how much more the revolution that has taken place in our lifetimes even with, with the microscope microbiology. That there are in this room, as I speak, enough real entities to destroy each one of us that if we could see them with the naked eye, would probably strike terror into our souls. But fortunately for us, we go along our merry way, completely oblivious to the myriads of uh, micro bodies that have the capacity to kill us. If we could see them all, we'd probably stay in bed hiding under the covers uh, for the rest of our lives. But we have learned through modern science that there are realities out there beyond the scope of our ability to perceive them. Now, why is it that we believe that germs that we can't see can be out there, but we have this bias that says you can't have supernatural uh, heavenly beings, spirit beings like angels, when the Scripture texts are full of them? That's one of the things that I love about this story, is the servant couldn't see what was really there until Elisha prayed and said, please, Lord, open his eyes. Let him see. Not let him see a hallucination. Not let him see a vision of what's not real. Let him see what's really out there. And when he opened his eyes, whew, the assembled host of angels was vastly superior in number and power to all of those chariots and armies of the king of Syria. And that's what God tells us is the world in which we live. You know, a similar incident that I think is revealing takes place in the New Testament. And it takes place, ironically, during the temptation of Jesus. Immediately after Jesus' baptism, the Spirit drives him into the Judean wilderness to be tempted of Satan. And you know that how Satan comes and he suggests that maybe Jesus really isn't the Son of God, even though the last words that Jesus had heard in his ears before he goes into the wilderness was the pronouncement from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so Satan comes to him just like he came to Adam you know, basically, did God say, you know, if you're the Son of God, you're hungry, turn these stones into bread. And that was the first temptation when Jesus responds by saying, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I'm involved in a fast here. I'm involved in a test. I'm sorry, Mr. Satan, but I'm not going to turn those stones into bread. I can do it. But I don't have the permission of my father to do it, so get away from me. And he quotes Scripture to Satan. Now, Satan, in the midst of this temptation, starts to quote Scripture back to Jesus. When he says, let me take you to the pinnacle of the temple and throw yourself down from the temple because the scriptures say that God will give his angels charge over you lest you dash your foot against the stone. So let's see if it's true. Let's see if you really are the son of God. Let's get up to the pinnacle of the temple and take a swan dive and see if the angels catch you. 
And Jesus had to correct the devil's hermeneutic and say, yeah, the Bible says that, but you have to interpret Scripture by Scripture, and you can't set Scripture against Scripture because the Bible also says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. So thank you very much. I'm not going to do that. And so when the temptations are finished, we are told almost as a concluding unscientific footnote that after Satan departed from Jesus for a season, what's the very next thing that happened? The angels came and ministered to Jesus. They were there all the time. Makes you wonder if he could see them like Elisha could. But God had given his angels charge over him. And the angels came to him in the midst of that crisis experience in his life. Immediately after the fallen angel departs, the heavenly host comes and they minister to Jesus. And it's significant that this host of angels attend Jesus again and again throughout his lifetime. Not only at the announcement of his birth, which we will look at separately, but also at the time of his resurrection when the disciples come and when the ladies come, there are the angels in the garden, one at the head, one at the foot, you know, saying, the one that you seek is not here. He's risen. He's gone into Galilee before you. And the angels of God, who are performing the function of, of messengers, of course, at that point, at the same time, are sentinels in the tomb. They're guarding the body of Christ. probably the most tender activity that the angels ever engaged in in all of redemptive history. Because God had ordained that His Holy One would not suffer corruption. And so He appoints the angels to be at the tomb. The angels are the escorts of Christ when He ascends into heaven, when He goes to His enthronement for his coronation as the King of Kings. He declares that when he returns, the end of the age, he will be accompanied by the heavenly host. That same heavenly host that was in the, that were present in the fields of Bethlehem when uh, the announcement of when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Again, I have to say to you, I don't know how you are, but when I think of the events that transpired during the life of Jesus, and then how the disciples, at least some of them, were eyewitnesses of almost every one of them. I asked myself, if I could have been an eyewitness of any event in the life of Jesus, what one would I choose? What one would I really like to have seen with my own eyes? And that's really a hard one. I mean, obviously, I would just be delighted to witness a resurrection. Who wouldn't? That would be fantastic. But it's hard for me to choose between the resurrection and the transfiguration. To see that burst, bursting forth of the glory of Christ through the veil of His humanity, where His countenance was changed, that would have been incredible. And the disciples never did get over that. They kept talking about, we beheld His glory. But one of the ones that I... I really savor. One of them, I just, I just, my imagination runs wild with me. And it's because I've been over there. And I, and I remember the time we went to Bethlehem and we went to the church there of the Nativity and so on. And they were going through the, all of the spiel inside the church and all of that and the guided tour. And I was not really turned on by that. And I left the company of those who were going through the tour and walked out by myself out to the edge of the of the church, and they had this little stone, primitive stone wall. And I went out and sat on that stone wall, and it looks out onto this vast, flat plain that were the fields of Bethlehem. And I just let my imagination run wild. I sat there and I said, imagine that night of pitch dark. A little campfire, maybe, bursting through the darkness. 
these peasants sitting around there trying to keep warm, trying to watch over their flocks, and all heaven breaks loose with the glory of God shining round about as the heavenly hosts begin to sing of the birth of Christ. Oh. Would I have, if I would have seen that, I would have said like Simeon, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. I've seen all I ever need to see. That, that is fantastic. But the angels are present in the moments, not only of the suffering of Christ, but in his glory. They attend him in the manifestation of his glory and of his exaltation, which are the things that, that the, the great saints of the ages would, would have loved to peer into, but have been given uh, only to a few in church history. And so, since the angels manifest the glory of God, only when the glory of God is eclipsed in a culture and in the church that angels are dismissed as insignificant. But where the glory of God is honored and the glory and exaltation of Christ is upheld, we see attending those moments in the past and in the future the heavenly host who serve as an escort for the king.